Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where we cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Dan, and it's on the 30th of March, 2024. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So yes, this is a Saturday episode to make up for missing uh, yesterday's episode, Friday's episode. Uh, I was just too tired. It's Good Friday, you know, spending time with friends and family. So I basically got home and was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm way too tired. And today's like kind of a day off and then back into it tomorrow and Monday. Uh, obviously, all the Easter festivities there. Uh, but yeah, that's why there is an episode today. But without Without further ado, let's jump into the news. So we had some fresh ETF related news in the, uh, I guess like this was Friday, um, basically from Bitwise here. Now, of course, I know you guys are uh, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty much like, in the same position as I am right now, where we're basically just playing a waiting game at this point till like May 23rd, or at least until like mid-April to see what the actual kind of thing is going to be with regards to the ETH ETFs. Like the market right now, I think is very like not confident in these things being approved by May 23rd. And you've seen that basically priced in, I think on both ETH USD and ETH BTC, just from like a market's perspective. I really do think that the market is, you know, is fading ETH really hard right now because of that. But it's kind of funny when you look at the way the market acts, because I personally believe that even a denial, like even if it does end up getting denied on May 23rd, that would still be bullish because if you look at markets and how they kind of price things in, like forward looking, essentially what happens is that if the market has already priced in the denial by the time it gets denied on May 23rd, then maybe there's like a small sell the news event or something like that. But then from then on, I don't really know who's left to sell, right? Like if everyone's already sold that wanted to sell before these things uh, kind of got denied on May 23rd, it kind of becomes a thing where it's like, okay, well, the price ends up going up and then it's self-fulfilling where everyone's like, oh, wow, the uh, ETF denial wasn't bearish after all for ETH, you know, let's let's go buy ETH sort of thing. So that's just some open speculation in how I view these things. Um, and I think that, you know, you know, the, the fact that the market is very kind of I guess like weary of of uh, of the ETF approvals at this point, like thinking they're not going to happen. If they do end up getting approved, I think that is again still bullish for Ethereum because essentially it means a lot of people didn't buy ETH because they assumed that the ETFs weren't going to get approved, and then the ETFs get, did get approved. And then, of course, we'll see inflows into that, which will be positive for the price. And then it just becomes a self-fulfilling thing again. So I don't think it's hopium to think that either a denial or an approval is, is bullish here, just for, for very different reasons, I think, uh, especially because, you know, ETH hasn't really outperformed. Like if ETH, let's say, was at all-time high already and ETH BTC was a lot higher than what it is now, then I would have a different view on things. I'd be like, okay, well, the market hasn't priced in a rejection of these ETFs yet. The market is actually pricing in an approval here. So that's why right now, I'm thinking, well, you know, the market's being quite efficient about this. They are, they, they seemingly uh, do, do tend to be uh, pricing in a denial on May 23rd here, but that could change very quickly too. Like, let's say in the next couple of weeks, we get like a lot of back and forth between the SEC and the issuers that begins to look like the ETH ETFs are going to get approved on May 23rd. Then you will very quickly see the market correct for that, I think, because the market is very sensitive to the ETF stuff right now. It is the main narrative still, I believe, um, especially you know outside of the crypto native market there. But Enough speculation on the price side of things. The actual update that I wanted to get to is actually pretty important here. So this was something from Bitwise. So Bitwise did their own uh, ETH correlation analysis with regards to the correlation between the ETH spot markets and the ETH um, futures markets here. So you can see here the actual correlation uh, is linked by Bitwise. I'll um, link it in the YouTube description below for you to check it out. But what's different about their analysis as opposed to Coinbase's analysis is that they tried as closely as they could to replicate the specific method methodology used by the SEC in their evaluation of Bitcoin. Um, and the results here are, are very encouraging for ETH. Basically, like very, very similar to Bitcoin. And also these results are still heavily influenced by the first three months of, of trading here. So once that rolls over, because it's done on a rolling basis, once that rolls over, it would it, it would seem like ETH and uh, ETH spot and ETH futures uh, correlation would be basically the same, if not better than, than Bitcoin here. So as I said, the reason why this is important is because it's trying to replicate the SEC's uh, methodology that they use for the BTC um, spot correlation, uh, spot futures correlation analysis here, rather than what Coinbase did, where essentially they had come up with their own own way of measuring that correlation. They didn't try to specifically I guess, recreate what the SEC did. And Coinbase has pretty much came to the same conclusion as what Bitwise has come to, where the correlation is very, very tight. And the reason why this is important is because people speculate that the SEC is going to deny the ETH ETS based on the fact that the correlation between spot and futures is, is not very tight, which means that there's ETH is open to manipulation on the, on the spot markets uh, or on the futures markets there. Um, but it's looking like they're not going to be able to deny based on that. Like, it looks like that if they do that, then essentially, I mean, they're opening themselves up to lawsuits because of that. 
they're opening themselves up to potentially interagency fights with the CFTC because the CFTC re um, uh, regulates the futures market, the CME futures market for ETH there, and they'd have something to say about that. They would be like, it just makes no sense to deny this based on this when essentially uh, the correlation is pretty much like a, a mirror of, of BTC here. And the other, I guess, speculation people have for the SEC to deny these things uh, is on the ETH as a security thing, which I think is even worse than denying based on correlation um, for a number of different reasons, but I'm not going to rehash all the reasons there. But yeah, you can go check out this analysis for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. Uh, but another reason why this is important as well is that it just shows that the issuers are not giving up on their ETH ETFs. Like they're still fighting, you know? And I don't think they would be doing this if they were convinced that there was like no chance that these things were getting approved. I feel like they're doing this because, you know, they, they do think there's a chance that, that it's, it's gonna get approved here. And they also wanna make sure that these aren't denied, even if they are denied, based on just like these frivolous things. So they can have basically a trail of, hey, you know, we provided this information, we did this analysis ourselves. And if the SEC does to decide to deny based on a weaker correlation here, they can then have a very strong, I guess, stance against that whether it materializes as a lawsuit or not. And that works in the favor of all the issuers, you know, even the ones who don't end up suing themselves, the other ones can use this material as, I guess, like evidence in, in, a, in a court of law, right? Um, but that wasn't the only update with regards to Bitwise. There was also the fact that Bitwise filed their S1 for their ETH ETF, um, and they also filed their 19B4 here, which you can kind of see. Um, and I think James had a chart or at least a, a table of all the ETH e ETF issuers and how pretty much all of them has fi have filed their 19B4 forms and S1 forms. So both of them need to be filed in order for this to get approved here. So all of them, except I believe Hashdex, ha have have um, uh, have filed for all of this. So yeah, it's just like a waiting game now for the SEC to either you know ask these issuers to remove things like the state portion of what they've filed here um, or maybe change a little bit a little bit of things here and there but really as I've discussed at length before there doesn't seem to be much to change between ETH and 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 and, and BTC right like if you look at the ETH and BTC ETFs they're pretty much like identical because if they're both just spot ETFs and remove the staking part of it then uh, they're both using the same custodians they're both they both have the same kind of correlation analysis uh, uh, done on it because they're both trading on CME and futures and, and on the same spot markets. So when you look at it like that, yeah, I mean, it, it, it still is a copy paste no matter which way you look at it there. But anyway, as I said, I'll link this correlation analysis that Bitwise did in the YouTube description for you to go check out below. All right, onto some ETH core dev updates. So Tim Biko put together his usual recap thread of the all core devs call here. This is quite a lengthy one. They discussed a bunch of different things. So I'm not gonna kind of rehash all of this, but I think one major aspect of the call was got to do with what I discussed on the last refill, I believe, or the one before that, about the network stability issues we were seeing with regards to blocks route, the, their relayer uh, basically not relaying uh, blocks with blobs in them properly, uh, which led to essentially like a fall off on the effectiveness of the network there. Now, there's been multiple different analysis on this from different parties. I think there was a post-mortem po uh, posted today about this uh, from, uh, I guess, like Bloxroute and I believe uh, Lighthouse chimed in on this as well because I think Bloxroute blamed Lighthouse for the issue when in reality it was Bloxroute's, Bloxroute's issue, not just with their relayer, but with this thing called the BDN, which is like this uh, private, I guess, mempool delivery network that they use to propagate uh, kind of uh, blocks throughout the network here. Um, and this has opened up discussions around EPBS again. So I think I, I yeah, I, I've got this tweet thread here from Michael Sproul, who basically discusses everything that I was just talking about, as well as why we need EPBS. Now, for those of you who don't know, EPBS is, stands for Enshrined Proposed Builder Separation. Essentially, what it's trying to do is get rid of the role of relayers as part of the Ethereum network. And the reason why we're trying to do this is because the MEV Boost pipeline, as I've discussed at length, is a sidecar, right? It's a sidecar to Ethereum, which means that the core devs do not have a good view over what's happening there and the MEV boost developers do not really have a good view of what's happening in core dev land so there are these two separate things that are essentially uh, very important obviously to the network both on on different sides here, but they're not really talking to each other because one, I mean, Flashbots is the creators of MEV Boost and a bunch of other things like Suave. They're, as far as I can tell, a for-profit entity, right? They're definitely, uh, got, you know, trying to to monetize certain aspects of things. And then you have Ethereum development and Ethereum core developers, uh, which is more of a, I guess, like public good style of development here where, where you're basically trying to build a neutral protocol. So there is this kind of odds, uh, incentive uh, kind of incentives at odds here with each other. So that's a major reason why 
Macor devs really want to integrate PBS uh, into the network or do ePBS because it essentially means that it's all enshrined in the protocol and, and it's easier for them to reason about here. But don't let me bore you with my ranting there. Please go read this thread from Michael Sproul who is uh, working on Lighthouse at Sigma Prime here. He does a really great job of explaining what happened, you know, with, with regards to the postmortem as well as how it wasn't a Lighthouse issue and what this all means for ePBS. So I'll link that in the YouTube description below for you to check out as well as Tim Biko's recap thread on the core dev call uh, for you for you to check out there as well. All right, so speaking of core dev related stuff, Josh Rudolph has another update for us on the latest Verkle implementers call. So this is call number 15. They were talking about a bunch of different things. There are updates about uh, from different client teams. There were testing updates uh, and, and updates uh, uh, as part of the cryptography performance improvements, summary of discussions from ETH Taipei and a testnet uh, relaunch here. So yeah, I mean, as usual, you can check this out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below uh, for you to do so, but just great to see continued work happening on Verkle Trees. Uh, you know, it seems like we could potentially get Verkle Trees in Osaka, which is the upgrade that's coming after Pectra or sometime next year there. It is a pretty big undertaking here, but it's also something, as I've discussed before, that's really needed within the network in order to enable other things. And as you can see here, there's a little kind of graphic here of what this is kind of enables, you know, this is the, uh, well, I mean, it's showing you like where the Ethereum scaling bottlenecks are. And then with vertical trees, we can enable things like history expiry and, and statelessness and state expiry, which is one of the scaling bottlenecks. You know, the history growth and the state growth is is, is definitely a, a huge bottleneck for the Ethereum network here. And I believe Paradigm had their blog post about this recently that you can go find that I, I believe I covered with regards to, you know, where's the growth happening on the Ethereum chain and what can we do to reduce growth in certain areas while still obviously keeping the trustlessness of the Ethereum chain uh, alive there. But anyway, you can go check this out for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, Eigenlayer's whole sky testnet with dual quorum support for Eig dual quorum support, I should say, for EigenDA has launched. So restakers, operators, and roll-up sequences, along with full nodes, uh, are, are able to test this launch, and this is one key step, more key step towards mainnet here. So dual quorum is basically uh, something that introduces robustness and decentralization by using two quorums to secure a proof of stake network. For now, uh, Wrapped ETH is the second staking asset. Future plans include native tokens for AVSs and rollups. And here's an explanation of how this works. It's called dual staking. I've talked about this on the refill before, but essentially dual quorum addresses several challenges for new proof of stake networks, including easier bootstrapping, price volatility mitigation, and as uh, well, a variety in consensus design. And uh, yeah, you can learn more about this in this uh, blog post. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. Um, but this is exciting because I believe that Eigen DA is targeting launch for like May or something like that, like April or May, I believe. So it's not too far. I mean, we're almost in April, right? But I believe, yeah, May, they want to target kind of mainnet launch here. And there's going to be a lot of AVSs going live with this, I believe. I don't know how many. EigenDA is obviously going to be the first a AVS live, but there are others out there that um, that, are, that are in the pipeline. Uh, I mean, I, I've lost track of how many there are at this point. And I think what's going to be interesting is to see like what the AVS landscape looks like, not just from the use cases, but also from where the stake is actually going to be placed. Because you've probably seen a lot of tweets from some of these restaking protocols lately, like uh, Etherfy and Swell basically saying, oh, we're going to put like the ETH that's staked with us against this a a AVS, you know, when they launch, and then we're going to be uh, kind of uh, lending our economic security to them. So it's going to be, as I said, curious to see where all of that lands, because I think it's going to be basically done on a, a maybe a two pronged process, like the short term, you're going to see people doing it on uh, AVSs that basically say, hey, you know, if you kind of uh, put your stake with us, we'll give you po points or token incentives, right? So it, it then essentially becomes like this huge thing of, well, you can farm the LRT points, then you can farm eigenlayer points, and then you can farm, uh, I guess, like these AVS points on top of that, which eventually all get turned into tokens, which may, you know, may be airdropped or, you know, pretty much certainly be airdropped there. But that's the short to medium term kind of stuff. But then we, we look at the long term and that's, okay, well, what is the actual natural yield that these protocols are, uh, you know, supplying for the people that are restaking with them or for the protocols that are restaking with them? And what I mean by natural yield is basically just like user demand. Like what's the the fear of a new for these networks what you know what are they generating there yes they can pay out token inflation but that's not a you know a natural real yield that's uh you know that's that, that that's a yield but like it's being paid out of tokens right so it's, it's very different we all know that token uh inflation is not you know long-term sustainable you know it, it just basically bringing forward the future 
and you pay for it later. So I, I, I'm just very curious to see how that all plays out. But it's probably going to take like you know, 12 to 18 months from when all these AVSs launch to see what what what, what kind of happens there. And uh, I think in terms of like what's going to generate the most revenue, it's going to be really hard to tell because as I've said before, you know, DA is a race to the bottom. So when you look at Eigen DA, you know, it's going to be really, really cheap when you get started. And they're targeting 10 mega, megabits per second, I believe, or megabytes per second throughput, which is a huge amount of throughput. I mean, it's more than Celestia can currently handle it's definitely more than ethereum l1 right now and if you actually look at the amount of revenue celestia is generating it's very very low right now it's, it, it, it's extremely low and that's because one it's very cheap uh, because they have so much capacity and two that capacity is not being filled so things like priority fees are not kicking in here like they did for blobs on ethereum l1 right so it's going to be very interesting to see like how long it takes for that to fill up obviously we expect it to fill up but then they're going to keep scaling that out and keep increasing that so then it becomes a question of okay what's the aggregate fees look like and then what is the net yield for people after that so i'm curious to see what happens there but da isn't the only thing that's launching um here there's going to be like shared sequencer networks launching there's going to be oracles launching so we're going to see what the revenue kind of looks like over time uh, against these things there. All right, so there has been an all-time high hit for monthly Uniswap volume on L2s. So you can see here that this is really only tracking uh, Arbitrum Base, uh, Polygon, and Optimism. Now, I believe this is Polygon's POS chain, which isn't an L2, but even if you take out the Polygon POS chain here, you can still see that just Base, Optimism, and Arbitrum alone still make it that it's an all-time high. And you can see the growth of Base here has just been absolutely massive, like even compared to last month. And obviously, this is because we have a bit of a Base season going on right now where a lot of people are like, bridging to, over to base to do a bunch of things. Uh, and when it comes to DeFi, I mean, a lot of this volume has got to do with some of the base meme coins that have been kind of popping off on there. So uh, I guess that's only natural there. But Arbitrum, you can see, has remained dominant you know, pretty much all throughout. Like Arbitrum has had a healthy DeFi ecosystem for a very long time now, and that's translated obviously into swap volumes on on Uniswap, uh, but so is Polygon. I mean, obviously, as I've said, Polygon POS is in a layer two yet. They are going to be a layer two when they convert it to a ZK Validium, um, but you know, that would basically be the same if there were a Validium or, or the POS chain here. You probably see more volume because as a Validium, they're probably gonna be uh, cheaper to use than they are as a, as a POS chain. Uh, so the volumes would still be the same whether they're an, an L2 or not. So I think that even if you include them or remove them, it, it, you know, it doesn't really make much of a difference here. Uh, but this is great to see. You know, I remember putting out that tweet that I highlighted the other day that I put out in like August where I said that I thought we would be getting like a layer two summer within like six to 12 months from that date. And we're pretty much smack bang in the middle of that. We're pretty much like at nine month mark since I said that. And that thesis was based on really mostly around EIP 4844 and base. And obviously with blobs going live, the cost came down for all the L2s. But but the reason why I focused on base in particular was because I think that there isn't just like, an, uh, you know, the real users onboarding from Coinbase and obviously Coinbase putting their weight behind it, but there is a narrative as well. Like base has kind of become a shelling point right now for people to come into the Ethereum L2 ecosystem because everyone's like, well, you know, Coinbase is the one behind base and, you know, base has a lot of stuff happening on it already with like a Farcaster and NFTs. So let's kind of do meme coins on base sort of thing. Now, whether that's sustainable or not, I mean, I don't think it's going to be long-term sustainable, but the, the way that meme coins can kind of be sustainable for ecosystems is that if there is already a really strong ecosystem there or one can develop over time after the meme coin mania subsides here. And I think that right now you can point to basically uh, Arbitrum and base uh, as having both of those ecosystems. I believe base has a very strong ecosystem outside of just meme coins. Same with Arbitrum. Uh, and I mean, Optim base falls into optimism for me. So I'm kind of talking about it as if it's like, the, you know, a similar thing here. And I think the same is true for Polygon as well. Even though the POS chain is in a layer two right now, I think the same thing is, is kind of true there. And you guys know me, I'm all about sustainable demand, sustainable revenue, sustainable everything when it comes to these networks. So I really do think that we have that, you know, right, right now with a lot of these major L2s. Now, obviously, bit too early to tell like what this is going to look like but we'll see we know we'll revisit in a year or something like that you guys know i'll keep covering this stuff but we'll see how that all shakes out there but i guess like kudos to everyone who stuck through it you can see what the growth has been look uh, has been like for these l2s there has been some quiet periods but then really since basically i guess like august last year it's been up only as you can see here of, of these volumes and it's only getting stronger and stronger over time uh which has just been insane to to see yeah 
All right, speaking of L2s, Jesse Pollack from Base uh, tweeted out uh, this nice little chart here that shows the gas limit uh, used slash price on Base. So you can see here that the gas plus transaction capacity went up, which is the blue line. Uh, the gas plus transactions usage went up, which is the purple line, but the base fees went uh, went way down, which is the yellow line. And they're going to be uh, incrementally scaling Base in a thoughtful, methodical way as time goes on. But this is awesome. You know, you can see here what the yellow line looks like, what the, the fees were like before they actually uh, kind of did it. So you have those massive spikes there, but then there was another spike, but then they raised their gas limit uh, up to, uh, you know, what is it, whatever it is, 37.5 uh, million, I believe. And then after that, like the transactions uh, and the gas used was still going up. You can see from the purple line, but the cost dropped because obviously uh, they increased the gas limit. So there was more capacity now and that capacity hasn't been filled up yet. So the fees dropped. Now, once that capacity fills up again, you're going to see the fees go up. But this is basically, I think, a really nice graph that illustrates what scaling is in a nutshell. It's basically, increasing the available capacity without, you know, I mean, make, making the user experience worse with lots of failed transactions and things like that, making sure that that purple line keeps going up because that is obviously a usage going up, demand going up, but that yellow line needs to be going down or needs to be kind of, you know, if it goes up, we scale some more and it goes back down. So that's the cat and mouse game that I've talked about a lot. We're basically chasing that that yellow line. Every time it goes up, we need to make sure that we are increasing the uh, the capacity so that I can go down again. And then we kind of monitor from there. And then once it goes up, we do the same thing again. So that's the, the fr I mean, I'm not going to say it's a forever cat and mouse game, but it is something that's going to be played for many years to come. There's going to be so, so much more demand coming in guys. Like it's actually insane. I don't think people realize how much demand is going to come in. There's so much demand on the sidelines. Like the, the very, I guess, like uh, definition of induced demand is in this chart here because every Every time you increase uh, the, the capacity, more and more people are going to be able to do more and more transactions and more and more transactions are going to be able to be done because it's cheaper and cheaper. And then you just have to keep kind of increasing it here. And this is why I said before that it's all about like the aggregate fees, not so much the individual fees, because I described this last time when I was trying to do like on the fly math. But essentially, if you have like millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of transactions a day happening, but they all cost less than a cent, that is worth much more, I think, than, uh, you know, doing one transaction that is worth $100 on Ethereum L1 mainnet, for example, because essentially that one transaction is being done by one entity, one person or one bot, uh, you know, and that one person or one bot has a bit of ETH to do that with, right, has a bit of exposure to ETH to do that with. But if you extend that out to the L2s and there's you know millions of people doing this, or tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people doing this every day, then ETH is in a lot more people's hands. And that really is the bull case for ETH to increase its network effect and to make sure that it's in as many people's hands as possible. And not just people, but bots as well, of course. You know, I don't like thinking of bots as second class citizens on the network. I believe that you know, that bots and human users are both equal on the network. Uh, you know, they're, they're both first class citizens in my mind. Uh, but I also believe that we, there needs to be a healthy balance between bots and humans where the bots shouldn't be pricing out the humans and the humans should be able to do their transactions in a you know fast and and, and, and nice way. But at the same time, humans are going to do 0.001% of the, all the transactions on these network. The vast majority of the transactions that happen will be from bots. And we wanna make it so that the bots are servicing the users rather than the users servicing the bots. And and, and, I, and I think that that would be the nice symbiotic relationship to, to kind of eventuate here, but it's gonna take us a while to get there because the bots main incentive right now is MEV. So we need to basically purge a lot of this negative MEV from the network so that the bots just don't go haywire and do negative stuff that affects users, such as censorship, right? We've seen this play out with MEV boost on layer one Ethereum um, and also a sandwich attacks, right? Like front running, all that sorts of stuff. We wanna make sure that users are protected from that and aren't, aren't getting wrecked by that. But at the same time, we don't want to treat bots as second class citizens because they do add a lot of value to the network. They do things like arbitrage, right? They keep prices in check. They add a lot of um, security to, to the network as well by keeping transaction fees uh, kind of high. This is for, for, for L1. And they also add to the deflationary nature of ETH. So there's all of that playing into it as well there. But anyway, enough about that. Moving on to the next piece of news here. So uh, I put out a cast on Firecaster where I said, Ag layer plus shared sequences. If you're not paying attention to these things, you should be. This tech will further supercharge the already dominant Ethereum L2 ecosystem. Now, you guys know about the Polygon Ag layer. I've talked about that plenty of times in the past before, as well as shared sequences. But I think that from what I've read and the people I've talked to, this is basically the holy grail here, and I'll explain why. 
uh, and this is my understanding of it. Um, I, you know, I, I might, might be wrong on, on things because these things are still quite early, but let me just kind of spell it out here. So for those of you who don't know what the ag layer is, it's this technology that Polygon is building, which is essentially a neutral layer that sits on top of Ethereum where all these assets can be stored. And then any L1, L2, L3, sidechain, whatever you want to call it, can tap into this and basically have a nice shared asset layer that becomes interoperable between all of these things. So obviously that's a huge unlock, right? That solves fragmented liquidity basically. Um, and it's an opt-in thing. And as I said, like, it's not just a Polygon thing. It's like Polygon's building it, but the ag layer is meant to be for everyone. It's meant to be like more of a public good than just like a locked in a kind of Polygon thing there, which is great. Like I love Polygon for doing that, um, but that's just for the assets. So people will then ask, okay, like then how do we kind of, uh, I guess, fix the fragmentation of execution of actually doing the transactions with those assets. And that's where shared sequencing comes in, where essentially Essentially, you basically have, again, this is an opt-in thing, but you have the L2s or whoever opt into these shared sequences and they could use, you know, the L1 validators as shared sequences as well with, uh, with base sequencing. But, you know, let's say they opt into them and then essentially what happens is that they can all interoperate with each other on the execution side. So from my understanding, you would be able to do a trade from uh, uh, Arbitrum and Optimism, uh, from Arbitrum to Optimism. Like, so, so for example, let's say you want to trade a coin that's only on Optimism and has all the liquidity uh, on Optimism there. Essentially what you do is you initiate the trade on Arbitrum and then you can do the trade uh, on, uh, through the shared sequencer uh, using uh, Optimism's kind of liquidity. And then the assets are all part of the ag layer, of course. And then essentially you get the, uh, you, that, that transaction gets executed, but everything's done on Arbitrum still. It's not, it's, it's not like you have to bridge to Optimism or anything like that. So we've basically eliminated the need for bridging here and we've solved the two biggest problems, the fragmentation of liquidity and the fragmentation of, um, of execution. Uh, because I think that the first thing is talked about all the time. And I don't think that's a, you know as big of an issue as the fragmentation of execution, of basically being isolated from being able to execute something on Arbitrum, uh, sorry, initiate a transaction on Arbitrum that executes on Optimism and then settles back to Arbitrum there. That's what these things like uh, shared sequences enable, at least from my understanding. But still early days for these things, I believe, but they're coming much faster than people think. You know, People used to say, oh, it's early days for ZK EVMs. They're going to take forever to come to market. Well, they didn't. I think the original timeline was like five years from when people were saying this and then ended up being like two years. So if people are saying the same thing about the ag layer and the shared sequences, I believe it's going to happen a lot faster than that. I actually do believe within the inside of the next 12 months, this stuff's all going to go live. And it's, and you know, as I said, it's opt in. So it's going to rely on these L2s to actually opt into this stuff. But I think that the, the, the incentive is there to opt in because you're basically increasing the pie for everyone by doing this. And it makes the user experience much, much better. But We'll see how that shakes out. But the tech itself, I have no doubt, works. Uh, you know, we've had shared sequences live on Testnet for a long time now. Uh, you know, Espresso, I think, is the leader here. But there's also Astria and a bunch of other projects. And then the Ag layer, I don't think it's on Testnet yet, but it's very, very well documented at uh, at this point. Uh, you can just search Polygon Ag layer and read all about it. I think um, Tim Robinson from the Daily Way community uh, had, had a really great blog post about this. You can just search his name and Ag layer. It should come up there. But yeah, I, I do think that... Uh, this is like the holy grail here, guys. And I do think it's coming a lot lot sooner than people think. And then once it's live, you see what happens when things are actually live and they're not just talked about anymore, when things become reality. Very, people very quickly catch on to it. The same is true for blobs, where we were talking about blobs for years and saying, hey, L2 fees are going to come down with blobs. And people would laugh at us and say, no, it's not. You know, uh, you know, show us what you got sort of thing. And it's like, okay, well, fair enough. You know, we're just talking about this stuff right now. We'll show you what we've got. And then immediately following blobs going live, everyone's suddenly like, oh my God, the L2s are actually cheap and they're fast. And oh my God, like Ethereum's actually scaling. So you can see how quickly the, nar the narrative changes here based on the reality. So as soon as these things are live and working, like the ag lay and the shared sequences, and people do start doing transactions where essentially they don't have to bridge anymore. They don't have to uh, you know, uh, worry about like fragmented liquidity. You're going to see that narrative very quickly change. And then I think that the FUD maybe turns mostly to like the same centralization of the L2s, like the central centralized sequences and you know, potentially like multi-sigs, things like that, which is the better stuff to like, not FUD, but like talk about because all this other stuff is more of a technical implementation. Whereas when it comes to the centralization of L2s, it's a lot more political and social where essentially the, it is, there is technical aspects to it. But what I mean by political and social is that 
they want to decentralize, but they have to do it in such a way where the DAO isn't given too much power so that the DAO can't run, you know, amok. And they also have to consider like security impl impl you know, implications from a social perspective too, because there are multi-sigs on here. But, you know, I argued this in the in the Daily Gray Discord channel the other day. These multi-sigs are, are huge. Like the ones that can do instant upgrades. So the, the um, security councils, like for example, the Polygon one, I believe, or the Arbitrum one, uh, or both of them, they're like a nine of 12 multi-sig. And all of the, the multi multi-sig signers are doxxed completely. Um, so essentially, when I look at that, I'm like, okay, well, yeah, okay, it's not decentralized. I'm not gonna call it that. But when you look at the actual kind of incentives at play here, the reason it exists is because if there's a major bug on the chain and we need to, or a major exploit that could be exploited, we need to be able to react, react, react to that quickly because you can't fork an L2 like you can fork an L1 to, to kind of fix that. Um, you can fork an L2, but it's very different to an L1. You would have to basically and to move all the liquidity across and you have to worry about the asset. I mean, it's a very big mess here. But what I mean, and I'm not trying to defend multi six here, but what I mean is that like the, let's say those nine people that, uh, that you know, need to sign a transaction for it to happen, the, the, the chances of them all colluding, right? And the chances of them doing that, given that they're doxxed, and the chances of them doing that in order to do something malicious on, on the network and not be caught before they even try to do it is so incredibly small because as I said, they're all doxxed. Most of them are independent from each other. Um, it's not in their best interest to do this at all because I, you know, we've already seen precedent of, of people getting arrested for doing stuff like this. Like there's just no incentive at all here. Um, so I guess for the short to medium term, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with, with these things because there are security concerns here, especially with ZK AVMs where the the ZK circuits are very new or untested. There is a very strong argument to be made that that is the lesser of two evils. Having a multi-sig is the lesser of two evils. And the other evil is basically uh, not having a multi-sig and then it being like fully decentralized from day one and there being a bug uh, and you can't fix the bug. And that means that everyone's assets get drained and then there's no recourse from that. So I think it's the lesser of two evils. It's not decentralized. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, not saying it's decentralized at all. It's still very centralized, but it's not that big of a deal, at least in the short to medium term in, in my eyes here. And it's also not that big of a deal because I believe that, that those things are going to get removed eventually, but we have to keep pushing on that uh, there. But anyway, enough on that. Uh, last couple of things to talk about here. Uh, just a dashboard that I wanted to highlight for you guys. So if you're interested in keeping up with everything Blob related, Hill Dobby has an amazing dashboard here that I think I've shown on the refuel before, but I just wanted to give it another shout out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. He tracks a lot of things got to do with Blobs on this and you can track along with, you know, who's posting the blobs, uh, you know, what the blobs look like over the past uh, five days, all those kind of things. So check that out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. And last up here, I know I've gone over 30 minutes. I just wanted to highlight a really important blog post from Vitalik where he basically titled it, Ethereum has blobs, where do we go from here? So this is essentially Vitalik laying out the, I guess, post-blob era Ethereum. Because I remember I, I said this like a few weeks ago and blobs went live, that we're now in the post-blob era Ethereum, which essentially means Ethereum is in a very different place to where it was before blobs. Essentially, we have scaled Ethereum out uh, you know, a lot at this point with blobs and we're going to continue scaling with blobs. So now the focus needs to kind of point or, or shift to the application layer because the infra layer or the infra stuff is done or in the process of being done. And we know what this kind of looks like with DAS and, 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 and data sharding and stuff like that. But when it comes to uh, the apps themselves, we have, he kind of argues this in his blog post. He says, we have no reason now not to build better apps because the fees are so cheap. Like before we could say, okay, well, it's expensive to use. The transactions are slow, you know, it's clunky UX, but the UX is getting rapidly better on like the wallet front. The fees have come down, the transactions are fast. So really we need to be experimenting at the app layer at this point. Like the infra layer, there's a lot happening there. Don't get me wrong, but we need to just shift over back to the app layer because there's no point having all of this infra if we don't have the apps to use it. And I don't think that we don't have the apps to use it. I think we do. But Vitalik's basically doing like a call to arms where he's like, let's make Ethereum cypherpunk again and let's make sure that we're focusing on the apps that are uniquely enabled by blockchains and let's, uh, you know, not talk too much more. I mean, not focus so much on the infrastructure now, but focus more so on the app layer stuff there. But anyway, you can go give Vitalik's blog post a read for yourself. Uh, but on that note, that's going to be it for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all next week. Thanks everyone.